Let's talk a little bit about the history of steam in regards to how I came And it's really hard to figure that out. The well, first, uh, whoever the fuck came up with this ever started bitch was based on uh, Arizona. A hundred and thirty dollar steam generator for a sauna is the man or the low man or they i don't know I'm trying to be politically correct here um they figured it out and all this thing is is a mini boiler and a exit um pipe and a water float valve like a toilet bowl float valve and an electric element and it just brings in a little bit of water and uh whatever. We'll do a little unboxing, shall we, to uh, kind of go down this avenue. And then we'll talk more about how you can utilize this into what scale. Then we'll talk about the shameful, shameful Bubba's barrel and the 20 you probably have that you spent fucking 20 grand on when you could have bought a boiler or a Sioux steam generator for 30 grand. Shame on you. Shame on you. Anyways. Oh, oh shit. This one's blue. Oh no, it's just got that blue plastic on it. All right. So Ah, this little triad of joy. Um, this thing in particular is really important. It's the temp control setting, but it's also the setting at which uh, you can trick these boilers or these sauna steamers to run 24 hours a day until you turn them off. That's a trick with these that most people don't know, even now. You know, what's the fucking um, Facebook shroomery page? It's something along the lines of... 300,000 people now and somebody just posted hey can I use one of these as a steam generator a bunch of people are like fuck no other people are like fuck yes and uh it's just funny to stumble across that right on the verge of making this video all right I won't talk while I'm opening a bunch of this bullshit so I don't fuck up the mics stick that with your field recordings <laughs> If I'm not mistaken, this comes with a lot more shit than it did before. <laughs> it kind of looks like it anyways. Okay, you got some valves for, I think, draining and flushing. It's got, ooh, a cat cable. Jesus, you can run this to like a controller or a computer now. And what's funny is these are the same prices. Like, it's nuts, man. This didn't really go up. It's a boiler though, so it's it comes with the same sort of issues as uh, any other large boiler. <laughs> Fuck you! <laughs> All right, short of getting tools to open this thing up, <clears throat> there are several different things we can talk about in regards to how this works. But basically, you have a controller, you have a steam outlet, you got a valve for overpressure, you know, just in case it blows. And then you get a water input. Um, you got your controller plugged in there and you got your power that comes in here. These are usually generally uh, 240 volt. Uh, I think you need 30 amps per. Um, don't quote me on that. You know, I'm not a fucking technician for all these Chinese fucking things. But these produce a kind of insane amount of steam for what they are. And what they do is they cycle. So there's a heating element inside of here that will burn out if you don't treat the water. And it fills and uh, basically, you know, uh, keeps a certain level of water in here so that steam can perpetually be heated up and then pulsed out. Um, what that's doing is creating like an immense amount of steam over a short period of time in a really contained space. <clears throat> what can you do with this? Um, a single one of these, you could probably build yourself like a, a small proofer um, uh, steam box. You could get yourself three of these and build a bigger steam box, something that does around 500 five pound blocks or 250 10 pound blocks. Um, they make these in seven and a half kilowatt, nine kilowatt, and I think upwards of like nine and a half to 12 kilowatt. Um, I think this one's seven kilowatt. <clears throat> I would stick with seven kilowatt. I don't know why they add more kilowatts to just add more power. We put these things side by side years ago and just to be very straightforward, there's no fucking difference in terms of adding more power into a unit like this. It doesn't generate any more steam whatsoever. Um, you see this all the time. You buy water solenoids like on Amazon. We buy them for the Fenner all the time, right? And, um, and we're making new fenders out of them. And some say 24 volts, some say 12 volts, some say 1224. 
just get seven kilowatt. Hopefully it uses less electricity because this will be the most costly, inefficient boiler you ever run, but it will be the only way that you can stop using a fucking Bubba's barrel or whatever else you're using. Um, it's a hundred and fucking sixty dollars. It's crazy. <clears throat> so what this thing does is you just plumb water into it, you plumb electrical to it, and you have a controller. There is some wiring that you can do um, to override this switch. Uh, one of the funny stories of that Mike and I were recounting before this episode is why did the Mycelium Man episode, which you should check out, um, I'm pointing like there's an invisible link because I see other YouTube people do it, and well, I don't know, fuck it. Anyways, maybe we can do that. <laughs> Um, he was crashing at the farm because you have to set this thing every hour uh, to get it to like run. It has a maximum 60 minute timer on it. And for some fucking reason, we never thought to just like look at the electrical board, daisy chain a couple things and then run it longer. Uh, in fact, you can just run it forever um, until the thing fucking burns out. <clears throat> the last thing I'll say about this particular unit in regards to how you treat it is yeah it's simple it's chintzy as fuck and it's like 150 bucks shipped to you is it's still a boiler and one of the main issues that anybody is going to have when you're heating up water is going to be sediment um, and silt and anything that creates you know chaos on the bottom of your boiler all those like compounding minerals create all of these horrible effects on the fire tube on the heating element on the water in general and what does this have to do with it has to do with is your water super hard or is it super soft you know and when we first started using these we were in westbrook maine and the water there was coincidentally very soft we got these to run for i think we had by the time we left there, I think we had two of these running one steam box cooking roughly 500 um, five pound blocks per run, which is crazy. If you think about how many fucking bags a Bubba barrel will fill, just think about that. We were doing 500 five pounders with two of these seven and a half kilowatts and it cost us 300 bucks. Uh, electricity, different story, but still Bubba barrels run off electricity. <clears throat> the advantage to using this is the fact that you can steam a lot quicker, but we'll talk about that later. Going back to the soft water thing, for some reason we didn't know how soft water affected boilers. We're just idiot fucking mushroom farmers, right? So we got up to Gardner, where we are right now, and we proceeded to plumb in our old fucking seam sterilizing sauna steamer units, and they died within, I don't know, a week? and uh, built up so much fucking crud in the actual boiler that uh, it was just done for. So they fried up the elements short and these things are not very safe. I will tell you that much. So they'll keep heating and sometimes they'll just blow the electrical load if you don't have the right um, uh, breaker on those units. So be very careful to get an electrician to actually plumb this in if you're not willing to do it yourself. Once again, it's 240, but they have different ratings in terms of amperage. So some of them you're gonna to wanna to put in like a, a 50, um, a 50 amp breaker, uh, two pole, some of them it's 30, some of them it's 20. And it really just depends on who the fuck is manufacturing these things. But they look no different from one another. They're all the same. The thing that we didn't know until we got up here and started to invest in more larger boilers was the fact that it's pretty important to soften your water or at least treat it. And that goes with these. It doesn't matter if you just bought like a $100,000 clear fire, high pressure boiler, like we'll show you soon, or something that's $120. The water going into here is 100% dependent upon the life of, um, or I should say the life of this is 100% dependent upon the water being put into this. You have two modes of water. Some people will be like, oh, let's just put distilled water or RO water. Water is either corrosive or extremely um, collective in terms of its mineral sourcing. So you have to build up so much scale over a short period of time 
to call these things bullshit and done. Or if you put in RO water, uh, it actually will corrode metal a lot faster. So something to keep in mind is getting a softener is not that expensive. Getting a carbon scrubber is not that expensive. And even an inline water treatment um, softener system, it's almost like a ball valve. You'll see it over there in the Sioux after we finish talking about this is it's like little ball valve that has a, uh, it's almost like a, a cake, fresh cakes. Um, and it dissolves in water over time to be able to treat the water in the boiler um, to keep the fire tubes and stuff clean. Same thing applies here. You're really trying to soften the water to be able to elongate the life of these things. If not, you'll end up like Joe from Cactus Hat and using this as a step to get from your garage into your house. That's just a fact. Daniel saw it with his own fucking eyes. Uh, they make a great step, I will say. Uh, unit of measurement wise, if you don't have one of these... Um, Milwaukee keychain, you know, uh, guys right now. Let's just say it is 12 inches by seven by 17 and a half. That's like a fucking great step. So if you treat it like shit and you don't fucking soften or treat the water, Just turn it into a fucking step, okay? Anyways, I'm gonna stop being a bitchy little dad about that and uh, just say that these are awesome options. I don't care if you're on a shroomery blog and somebody says otherwise, they probably didn't treat the water, or they hated it, or they didn't run it enough, or they tried to steam too much or too little. Um, if you have a Bubba's barrel and you're sick of replacing the stupid fucking elements in the bottom that burn out because you can't really pre-treat water unless you have a large system um, that's gonna fill through that float valve uh, at the bottom of a Bubba's barrel, you can just cut it out and plumb this in and just have a drain. So there are options there in regards to using these things to sort of circumnavigate something as clunky and ridiculous as a Bubba's barrel. Um, Something I will say about these steam generators is kind of interesting and that's why I made notes. Um, there are different ways to go about building containers and it's an episode we haven't really like gone down the rabbit hole of trying to like pair these things yet. Although we did have a circle back episode about uh, sterilization versus pasteurization and the chambers in which we use, right? Um, it's funny, there's this woman, I can't think of her name. Uh, she was on CMGN for quite a while. I think she was in uh, Cambodia, maybe? Uh, I think she was growing mostly milky mushrooms. And she didn't use these necessarily. It was maybe these, maybe something else. She just mounted them to a wall and had like these large rubber hoses. Um, and she would just basically put her substrate in RPC containers that are like these guys right behind me. If you can get a nice clean shot of those. These RPC containers are fucking so cheap. Like it's unbelievable. Um, so you can fill your substrate in those, stack them outside. And she literally just had a tarp and she would put a tarp over these, tuck the tarp in raw fucking dirt ground, plumb this into the side or just under the tarp and fill that fucker with goddamn steam. And it would get up to around 200 uh, Fahrenheit in X amount of hours, she'd hold it, and then immediately pull those carts out into a cool down room. She actually did have a lab, I think. Um, and then I think somebody saw that. I don't know if James Shoup saw that. Uh, James Shoup is somebody who I first reached out to when I was going through making stuff. Um, I think he had a blog spot too. <laughs> we should find it. <laughs> and then uh, Cyrus Lester was the last person I knew, and I think he switched now to a container. Um, but there's something to be said for using these units for anything from tarp grows to bubba barrels, um, to plumbing them into your own custom fabricated proofer or stainless steel steam boxes to a 10 foot shipping container. Um, we went to the extent of making our own steam boxes in the beginning. We got some pictures online about this and I think you can see the three holes where we had like three of these plumbed in <laughs> and like, it's not worth it. Don't do that. Um, after a while, if you can afford a boiler, just get the fucking boiler. But we bootstrapped it to the point where we had three of these and then we we're like, let's get a fucking boiler because Gardner water keeps murdering these and we just didn't treat the water. Um, but if you get a shipping container, instead of building these custom, you know, things that you think you can trap steam in with, 
Um, it gives you a, a fair about fair bit more control. Um, and without getting crazy into that, uh, you can go back and look at that episode or watch that episode. And uh, that'll sort of kind of cue you in in terms of like inputting steam and exhausting uh, stale air and steam and creating that sort of forever vortex uh, system in order to actually accurately pasteurize what your um, media requires. So these things are versatile. They're great. They're dangerous. <laughs> they have lit on fire multiple times. Uh, for many different farms, but mostly that comes down to just mistreating it uh, and treating it like the $160 question mark that it is. But pre-treat the water, uh, get an electrician to do the proper um, electrical work and uh, you'll be fine. And you'll actually love them for a long time, They're pretty great. And like ours didn't have these little boiler uh, or release valves. So that's kind of interesting. <laughs> They're learning. <laughs> um, all right, what else to say about these guys? Something that I've tried to advocate for a lot of people to do over the years, and Ethan and I are in the process of just collecting some materials to demonstrate this, but I'll do a drawing in case this comes up before we have enough time to do that, is utilizing one of these with a rubber steam hose to go to basically an in-between of, uh, I find a lot of farms are at this, this point where they're like, we're not really ready to get rid of our Bubba's barrel and buy a boiler and a shipping container. So what do we do? What's next, you know? And the major issues with Bubba barrels are a laundry list, you know? Not only do you have to like reach in to put all your blocks in, reach in to pull your sterile blocks out, the human interaction in that is not only a contamination vector, these things because of their electric heating element um, require like 19 to 20 hours to fucking cook. Some people let them cool down in there and that creates a whole different level of chaos. And when that happens, you're pulling in contaminants possibly, um, or you're having to wheel these things into your like sterile cool down system. Whatever it is, is very efficient, but what we've been trying to tell people for ages is like, just think about a 55 gallon drum or a Bubba's barrel upside down. If you flip that fucker upside down, where do you start with? You start with the lid. If you put casters on the bottom of the lid, what do you have? You just have a, a, a wheelie cart, you know, a lid that just rolls around, right? And then if you slide a barrel on top of it, you have an enclosed in, in container. So take that barrel back off now. And what do you do? You build a rack system that's basically a central trunk coming off of the base of the barrel or the lid, I should say, and the casters. And then you just create some pegs that are coming out. You can weld them on with a fucking shitty stick welder. You could uh, clamp them, bolt them, whatever. You're just trying to make almost like a tree that will fit with inside of this barrel so that you can fill blocks in and very easily with two welded on handles or bolted on handles, slide the top of the barrel over, clamp, plumb this right in just with a quick, quick connect and fire it up and you'll just have steam jamming in one side and air and steam jamming out the other side. That's gonna get you up to temperature a lot fucking quicker than using a Bubba's barrel or using an electric water heater element. And you're gonna use about the same electricity. So it's gonna run for between seven to 10 hours as opposed to 19 to 24 hours. Um, once again, and I'll remind you, is just trying to get your pasteurization to get up to temp and just hold for two hours above two, 200 Fahrenheit, um, maybe three hours. And then immediately you can bring this fucking thing out into the lab and you can pull the top of the barrel off and you can let that thing cool under HEPA filters. What did you not do? You didn't act like a fool and get above his barrel and just put your fucking blocks in and have to pull your blocks the fuck out. I don't know. Bubba seems like a great guy. I've seen some photos of this guy. He shakes hand with enemies of mine, but you know, fuck it. I just don't think bubble barrels are the way to go. They're not expandable and uh, they're challenging. This is a lot fucking cheaper and it will get you somewhere a lot faster. You could even plumb this uh, to, you know, maybe four barrels like that. You could get bigger barrels. Anything that allows you to cool down in a sterile environment and increase your pasteuriz or decrease your pasteurization time by increasing your steam input will give you better yields, will give you healthier substrate and faster incubation. And it'll just basically, I don't know, it'll save the day. So that's all I have to say about sauna steamers in general. 
they are useful, they are terrifying, but if you're brave enough, you did start a mushroom farm, you'll be okay. I think the next thing we're gonna move on to is the Sioux steam generator. So I won't go into too much detail now as a talking head in front of you, but we'll actually walk down to the steamer, we'll fire it up, we'll turn it on, we'll talk about the BTUs, and then you'll see it running into the steam box and just how much steam capacity that fucker has. A lot more than this, but still, this will get you somewhere. As I said, we were doing 500 five pound blocks in like a 16 hour timeline um, using three of these. So you can do it. It's not that far fledged. To the Sioux steam generator. <laughs> Let's see, this is the Sioux Corp SF25. It's a Scotch Marine boiler. <clears throat> um, the first person I ever saw buy this uh, was Eric Milligan of New Hampshire Mushroom Company. And he sort of gave us the idea. His idea was batshit crazy, might I tell you. He decided to build a concrete bunker of a steam pasteurizer with permanently affixed shelves, which made no sense and it is the behavior of psychotic mushroom growers that do things like this. But he would use a Sioux steam generator, specifically this 1.1 million BTU uh, SF25. Sioux also makes a boiler, uh, it's the SF11. It's about the same volume, smaller burner, um, and I think it's a half a million BTUs. So you can use either uh, Amy, Fox Farm and Forage Amy, uh, Amy and James. They use uh, this boiler in particular, but the SF11 version. And I think they're steaming in like a 10 foot container. Um, this one allows you to go from between 20 to 40 foot containers. Uh, so you can pasteurize or super pasteurize anywhere from 3,000, or I should say one block, up to about 6,000 blocks in a go. Um, you're never going to find an autoclave large enough to be able to do something like that. <clears throat> it's just not like feasible to get something that large up without a substantial amount of money. So this thing I think is about $30,000, but it's pretty simple. Um, the whole thing operates on propane. These can come on skids. Um, they're made for a plethora of different industries from pasteurizing uh, different soils to doing things like aggregate work. Um, and it's really a, a plug and play system. We have a chimney uh, specifically because we're operating this thing indoors year round. So this thing starts at the front. We have our firebox uh, electronics. Fire starts and is ignited in here from the propane line. So we're gonna open our propane line up. Don't really ever have to close that off, but you know, emergencies be emergencies. Um, this propane line goes into uh, the ignition system and the igniters that fire tubes straight to the back. We talked about this before, but one of the major concerns of the boiler of this size is choosing not to fuck it up in regards to treatment of water. So up above me is something that Sue just started creating, which is sort of an inline filtration system. And all you do is just pex that fucker right in line. It's the simplest thing. Um, I've got some replacements right here. Um, these little cartridge replacements are probably good for a couple months. I'd say three or four months at the rate of running this five days a week. Um, and all it is is a gasket and a little tube that plums up in that ball jar. And it's just full of, you know, um, anti-scale uh, softening material. Some sort of specialized agent, specialized agent that they use for uh, water treatments for boilers. So filters, treats, so on and so forth, gets rid of scale or prevents scale to a degree. Um, so we got our propane line and we got our water line coming in. And then we have at the top of the boiler, our steam line going out. This thing has a full 10 rotations of a gate valve to open fully. That's sweet. Because this is a low pressure boiler, it's kind of important to not go too far with it uh, or you'll just cycle the boiler. Some of the questions people have in regards to running these boilers uh, with something like a shipping container is how do you control that sort of ebb and flow of steam 
and um, uh, wherever you're putting it into. Is there a thermocouple? How does it work? Well, this is how it works. You're going to use far more fucking steam through a pass-through pasteurization system than you would trying to recoup anything. So the goal of this unit is to basically add water to the boiler, <clears throat> have the boiler generate steam, steam flows in the direction of the actual uh, place in which you're trying to pasteurize, and then it cuts off. Steam will continue traveling out as this refills with some water. Boiler elements, fire tubes start turning that water into steam. And once again, this flushes on. So this will cycle and it'll just keep cycling. Um, one of the things that you can do is check out the pressure um, uh, regulation systems over here. These are just regular spring, you know, looped Honeywell systems. So its main uh, PSI is going to be at 15 or just below. And then you have differentials in main. <laughs> She doesn't give a shit. <laughs> so for our main and for our differential, we try to shoot this thing up to a maximum of around 10 and our differential is uh, between five and seven. So the goal really is to like, um, you know, have this pressure inside of this vessel just ebbing and flowing, you know, up and down, um, not have everything cranked all the way the fuck up because you're just gonna run into too many wide cycles when you try and do something like that. This is supposed to just kind of like empty and flow out, empty and flow out, empty and flow out. Um, it's got pressure switches, it's got a pumpkin uh, for any sort of blowdown stuff um, and getting any fresh water out. Uh, and then at the base of this thing, um, we'll have a pressure line that goes out for blowdowns. Blowdowns are extremely important when you're uh, running a boiler like this. And what it is, is essentially a quick surge of uh, opening and closing the um, water that's in here that's under pressure, allowing any of that uh, sediment to sort of be kicked up and hopefully purged out to a degree. So blowdowns are as important as um, filtering or treating the water going into the boiler. I'm not a fucking boiler tech. We just learned this shit over time, you know? It takes a long time to figure these things out. But once you get them dialed in, this has been running with us for, fuck, how long have you been in this building? Seven years, you know? Uh, the thing that burns out on it are the caps on the back. Um, it's a whole other fucking story, but that really comes down to water treatment as well. So our protocol for turning these things on is making sure we have water that's filtered, fed to the boiler, which we did and let it fill up. Turn your propane on. And um, and then for, for this sake, because we want to show you how much steam comes out of this, we're going to close this valve. Normally, <clears throat> we open this valve uh, three full turns. So one, two, three. And that lets it out, you know, just enough to get a <laughs> epic amount of steam to that container and no more than we actually want the sort of um, unit to cycle. So this is another factor in restricting steam going to your container. So for now, tie that down and we'll get this thing up. This is how easy this machine is to turn on. And just turn it 90 degrees, quite like that. And once all of these are lit up, the boiler will operate. But you have manual reset level switch, you have water feeder level switch, you have adjustable pressure switch, and you have your manual reset pressure switch. Those are all a go, you're good to go. So this <clears throat> right here will start going through its cycle. Fire will start going into here, and you're gonna end up seeing that gate open as it starts to exhaust out. So let's just watch it go through its cycle for a minute. There she blows, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> so it should shut off somewhere right around 7 PSI, I think. Somewhere right in here. And then what it's going to do is it's going to wait for the pressure to be released. And then it'll drop in pressure and kick back on when it gets to zero after the water feed continues.
All right, so the boiler has now reached its like maximum set pressure. The fans for the burners continue to circulate for a minute and then it starts cooling off and the flames um, finally like retarded inside. So once it winds down, this boiler just stays at pressure until you open that valve up top. So how about we go light up the steam box and see what the steam looks like coming out, man. All right, cool. So now we're, uh, I don't know, what? 60 feet away from the Sioux boiler, all the way in the steam box. And uh, we're just gonna have Ethan, go ahead, open it up three turns and you'll see what chugs out of here. First, we'll have some water and then it'll follow by steam. It's pretty fucking vicious. Oh, here comes the water. You ready for it? It's coming. I'm right in the line of fire. This is gonna get exciting. Yeah. Clickety clackety. Oh, man. I didn't know. Oh yeah, buddy. Oh. There she blows. <laughs> so I say this is going to produce a little more steam than a hundred and sixty dollar fucking steam generator from China. So.